Six Arab countries, led by the Saudis, suspended diplomatic relations with Qatar and accused the energy-rich state of sponsoring terrorism. Some of the involved nations have already issued travel bans to Qatar, which has created an immediate crisis for the country. Most of the involved governments don't see eye to eye and have their own reasons to cut relations with Qatar and even though the developments may come as a surprise, one thing is certain, the crisis has more to do with the long-standing geopolitical tensions rather than outright security. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. If you want to help us to produce more content like this, visit our fundraising page at patreon.com slash Caspian Report. The current diplomatic crisis goes back to a statement by the head of state of Qatar during a military graduation speech in May 2017, Sheikh Tamim was quoted making several comments that favored the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas and Iran. The Qatar news agency, which had published the story, quickly deleted the comments, blamed them on hackers and appealed for calmness. Regardless of whether the comments were fabricated or not, it triggered a response from the neighboring governments and within a couple of hours, accusations were made by both sides. Shortly thereafter, Qatar state-funded broadcaster Al Jazeera published leaks that linked the officials from the United Arab Emirates to a pro-Israeli think tank. Following this, the other Gulf states banned Al Jazeera, made additional accusations and announced their intent to suspend relations with Qatar. The course of action was later on joined by respective allies such as Egypt, Bahrain, the Tobruk-based government in Libya, the Saudi-sponsored government in Yemen and the Maldives, which has close financial ties with the United Arab Emirates. In any case, as soon as the decision was announced, Saudi security forces blocked the entrance to Qatar's land border and in addition to the blockade, Emirate Airlines, Gulf Air, Fly Dubai, Etihad Airways cancelled flights to Doha. Meanwhile, Qatari citizens have been given two weeks to return to Qatar, while diplomatic personnel has been given a deadline of two days. Closing the land border and airspace is meant to exert pressure on Qatar, as the country only has one land border and two main air routes. As Riyadh and Manama issued travel bans to Doha, the state-owned Qatar Airways lost 19 destinations. Obviously, this will aggravate the situation for the multinational company, which has been steadily losing brand value since 2016. Furthermore, as a small country in the east of the Arabian Peninsula and west of the Persian Gulf, Doha is dependent on the import of goods. For instance, about 40% of Qatar's food import are shipped from Saudi Arabia. Iran could alleviate Qatar food imports but a sharp increase in food prices is unavoidable. Essentially, Doha's dependency on food imports is its biggest vulnerability. By applying pressure to Qatar, the Saudis hope to change the status quo in the region. The two countries have a long history of conflicting foreign policies. For instance, when Riyadh reduced its support for the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas, Doha and Ankara stepped up and compensated. When the Saudis endorsed Field Marshal Haftar in Libya, the Qataris did the opposite and promoted the Islamist militias in Tripoli. Despite its small population, Qatar has been able to forge its own foreign policy. This is due to the fact that the country lacks internal ethno-religious tensions and political insecurities that its neighbors must contend. Plus, the country is abundantly rich in energy resources. This level of security allows for Doha to fuel tens of millions of dollars from its $100 billion infrastructure plan, which is set aside for the 2022 FIFA World Cup Games, to radical groupings such as Taliban insurgents, Syrian generals, Somali Islamists, Sudanese rebels, militants of Hamas and even members of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's also noteworthy to mention that Qatar's policy-making body exists out of a handful of people. This gives the country the capacity to make swift decisions. For instance, in 2012, while the Saudis were debating who to arm in Syria, the Qataris had already packed their planes and sent them over to the conflict zone. 
Evidently, this network of radical organizations has upset many nations. However, from Qatari perspective, by transforming itself as an indispensable mediator and enabling back-channel diplomacy, Qatar gains leverage with countries that seek to control the behavior of these groups. Doha's foreign policy has been met with mixed results. In some cases, the network orchestrated the exchange of prisoners, gained concessions from the Al Nusra front in Syria and even resulted in the resignation of Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers from Egypt's parliament. In other cases, however, it has resulted in the spectacular destabilization of the Middle East and the acceleration of jihadist factions. Yet Qatar is far from the only country whose covert intervention has had negative repercussions. Saudi Arabia has also backed radical groups and individuals in Syria, Libya, Iraq and Yemen. The same controversy applies to the UAE, Iran, Turkey, Russia and even the United States. States, there are no innocents in this geopolitical struggle. For better or worse, Qatar's radical network allows the country to play a significant role in the Middle East and thus earn the favor of Washington. To that end, American policymakers have tolerated Qatar's network, its neighbors however have not. In 2014, authorities in Riyadh and Abu Dhabi had a fallout with Doha over the latter's support for the Muslim Brotherhood as well as Al Jazeera's critical coverage of the political events in the region. As a result, Saudi Arabia and the UAE temporarily withdrew their ambassadors from Qatar. Doha reeled back support for its network and made some assurances which returned relations to nominal, yet at large, Sheikh Tamim still refused refuses to play along with King Salman and instead turned to Turkey and Iran. Within two years, Turkey opened its first military base in Qatar and this has given Ankara a greater capacity to reshape the politics in the Gulf region but it also upset the Saudis. A more recent convergence of factors is President Trump's visit to the Saudi Kingdom in May 2017, which inadvertently emboldened the leadership in Riyadh. Only a few days after the visit, King Salman singled out Iran as the world's main sponsor of terror. It's possible that the policymakers in Saudi Arabia also saw an opportunity to force Doha to realign its interests with that of Riyadh. The sheer scale of the media spectacle in Saudi Arabia suggests that a campaign to discredit Qatar was already planned ahead. As such, after years of threats and pressure, the Saudis coordinated a plan of action to change the course of Qatar's foreign policy. What will happen next will be dictated by the Trump administration's response. As of this writing, the US Command Center for the Operations Against ISIS along with 10,000 American military personnel are stationed in Qatar. Washington needs its airbase in Qatar to continue the fight against ISIS. Besides the current operations, the United States has also expressed plans to bring about an Arab NATO led by Saudi Arabia and and armed by American weaponry while focused on containing Iran's sphere of influence. Such a military coalition requires the participation of Qatar. Meanwhile, for Qatar, the country cannot survive in a volatile neighborhood without a security guarantor. So Doha needs Washington to preserve its sovereignty. And even though the military ties with Turkey have strengthened, Turkey is not a substitute for the United States. Therefore, any decision that Doha or Washington makes will have to consider the respective interests. Either way, what is certain is that unlike the statements of the global and regional leaders, the current diplomatic crisis will have no significant impact on the global fight against terrorism. In any case, this was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. Special thanks to our contributors on Patreon who suggested this topic and provide the means for our channel to remain independent. And if you want to be part of that process, visit our fundraising page at patreon.com slash Caspian Report. Anyway, thank you for your time and sahol.